Okay, so I'm going to introduce a very esteemed panel of uh, ladies in game design. Uh, I actually need notes because literally these people have done so much stuff that I don't feel like I can play proper homage without having some uh, a little cheat sheet. Uh, so I'm going to introduce Danielle Swank first. Uh, just wave when I say your name, because unfortunately they're not in the order that I have them on my sheet. Um, <laughs> uh, mostly because her name is the same as mine, and it's very rare that I'm actually on a panel with someone that has the name Danielle, or, like, or meet someone who has that name. Uh, so she is a game designer, an engineer. She runs a studio in San Francisco called Barking Mouse Studios. Uh, she has kind of lived, I think, the indie dream a little bit, which is her first game, Lost Toys, sold 60,000 copies. It was featured by Apple, which I think if you're an indie developer, is kind of like the very first thing where you're like, wow, my game got featured. Um, and she's won a t and the game won a ton of awards as well. Uh, the company is a couple years old, and in addition to running the company, she does a bunch for the indie community itself. Uh, she runs a game dev study group that has about 600 members that's focused on kind of fostering community around independent game development uh, and a co-working space that kind of has the same mission called Game Nest. Uh, and she's also doing a project right now called Make Games Box. It's a subscription type of service that gives you design tools essentially on a monthly basis. Wait. <laughs> uh, so uh, our next panelist uh, is Anna Kipnis. Uh, she is a uh, senior gameplay programmer at Double Fine. Uh, she's been there for 13 years, which I think is amazing and an amazing testament to a great studio. Um, she's worked on, for me, a bunch of games that I actually have played and really liked. So Psychonauts, Brutal Legend, Costume Quest, uh, Once Upon a Monster, The Cave, Broken Age. And then she actually, in 2014, uh, did a game where she designed it and led the prototype. It's called Dear Leader. Uh, it's got a great documentary series that Double Fine produced uh, as part of their, their prototyping process, which is really awesome. It's uh, online, really, really easy to find with Google. Um, she's also kind of got that same theme, which is she's done a lot in terms of the community as well as her job. Um, so she founded a game jam called Mullah Jam. I guess everybody probably knows that's inspired by Peter Mullinex. Um, she also uh, serves on the IGF and is a UCSC for their masters in games and playable media. She's an advisor to that program. So uh, Jane Ng, who is right next to me, uh, she's a lead artist at Campo Santo. They're doing a game called Firewatch right now, and she's doing all of their environmental art um, and all of their lighting. So she worked at EA. She worked actually on Spore and the Creature Creator, The Godfather, some pretty big titles for them. Um, and her, her role as essentially a, an environmental artist has led into a lot of other areas like level design. So it's, it's, it'll be interesting to talk to this panel about how while your everyday job might not be game design, how many things actually wind up over intersecting or overlapping with design, or how many different types of designers there are. Uh, she's done projects really that are kind of amazing in terms of kind of the swing. It's iOS porting, big, huge open world productions, um, and you know smaller studios, bigger studios, so a lot of experience there. Uh, My Tran. Uh, is a, our panelist on the end. She works at Storm 8 right now. They are a uh, mobile game studio. Uh, she has the distinction of having released three games in her career that have all been in iOS and Android top grossing. So I think we can all aspire to actually be able to say something like that about ourselves in a couple of years. Uh, she's been called the monetization maestro by GameSauce, uh, and she has won the Evil Game Design Challenge, which is a casual connect uh, session that essentially has you design a game, but you're kind of a a black hat monetization person while you're doing it, so it's a little bit of a parody. Very fun. Uh, she also has launched a site that kind of celebrates the game developer and game development lifestyle called the 24-bit. Uh, I definitely advise you guys check it out. Some really good profiles on there. Uh, and then our last panelist is uh, Lauren Kaysen. She is a 3D concept artist and a 3D artist. Uh, she works at Phonomina. She has really got some serious variants in her career from what I've seen. Uh, MIT Media Lab, so kind of far-reaching, interesting, you know, game stuff that maybe isn't gonna be out there, but it's still really cool and fun to work on. Uh, she worked at Zynga, and then she worked at Harmonix, uh, or Harmonix, sorry. Uh, so MMOs, mobile games, uh, lots and lots of, uh, you know, music and dance type games. It really, I think, a very interesting background. And again, that same, I did something, I do games for my living, and and then I also kind of give something back to the community type of a vibe. So she works with um, 
uh, as a mentor and a teacher for arts and technology in juvenile detention centers, charter schools. She does the Intel Computer Clubhouse, and she works with Girls Make Games. So please welcome our panel, and we will... We're going to have each of the panelists describe what they do in a typical day and what you do in a not-so-typical day. So we're going to start off with you. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm an environment artist, so some people would be surprised that I'm on a design panel. So I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, so my company that I'm working for right now is called Campo Santo, and it's a company of 10 people. So we don't really have titles, but we just have spheres of sort of responsibility. And since we're making a story-driven um, exploration first-person title, a lot of the design is either sort of narrative design, aka like story writing, character building, that kind of stuff, or um, level design in the exploration sense. Can you guys hear me? I should probably talk. Okay. Um, so since I'm doing um, a lot of the 3D uh, environment art, my um, art making is very intimately tied to level design. So I'll describe a little bit of how that works. Um, so there's the, uh, like usually about half the studio sort of talks about how the story goes, and the exploration is still sort of in the surface of that since we're trying to tell a story. Um, I'm not personally involved just because, you know, I already have enough to do, but, you know, I'm free, I'm free to participate if I want, but I usually choose not to. Um, so let's say um, the story requires the player to go from point A to point B, and then um, someone else after the story meetings will usually be like, well, we kind of think we want to go from point A to point B, and we want to about like 15 minutes, and it should feel like you hiked a mile. So that's kind of the design constraints. And then I have to make that, well, they usually sort of mock it out with gray boxes, really sort of minimal. And then I get to turn it into Disneyland. <laughs> um, so I will basically have to take that kind of information and make it an interesting 15-minute walk. And, um, and I get a lot of free reign to like designing how the space actually needs to feel like a national forest in Wyoming. Or just like, well, how exactly do you go from, I'm just using a random Disneyland example. How do you make it interesting to walk from the haunted mansion to Space Mountain? You know, there's a lot of actual level design, even if you know exactly what you want a player to do. So I do a lot of sort of um, sight line, you know, control sight lines, because you want people to have a sense of discovery as they're walking along a 15 minute thing. And the more you can sort of add that to just a simple path, like instead of a straight hallway, actually doing an S curve or like having some sort of like, you know, discovery along the way um, really adds to the experience. And that's mostly the kind of design I do. I do that basically every day. I think that's a pretty good job. Hi guys. Um, so I am a gameplay programmer and um, I, well in general gameplay programming and design have a great deal of overlap. In fact when we interview our um, gameplay programmers we do specific questions targeted at the applicant's design sense. Um, at Double Fine, traditionally, um, we have had very few designers, um, so gameplay programmers and world builders, I actually worked with Jane for quite some time, um, took over different, like, they, they kind of uh, took over different aspects of design. Like, for instance, Jane would be designing, the, like, what she, what she kind of described, which would be the actual, you know, the physical space uh, design of the place, you know, making it interesting to walk around and getting the scale correct for the character and, like, all these really important questions before you can even design puzzles really for anything that you're working on. And then for um, we would get, usually so our games at Double Fine tend to be very narrative driven. And so we would get kind of um, a, a, more like a script for what it is that is supposed to happen in this place and very kind of loose ideas for puzzles. And it would be kind of part of my responsibility to iterate, you know, create, um, design little puzzles and fill in the gaps of the design. Sometimes, sometimes the design is very specific, and that's especially if you're working with a designer. We have had, like on Brutal Legend, when we worked together, we did have some designers um, specifically, you know, uh, working on puzzles and uh, mechanics and things like that. So we, we would work closer with them. But even there, you there's just so many things that once you take a design and try to implement it, there are still a lot of little design gaps that you have to fill. Um, the other experience I had that was more, I guess, traditional design was I got to lead the um, Dear Leader prototype uh, for Amnesia Fortnite, which you, you guys, if you want to see, it's on YouTube. Um, 
which is uh, we I had to pitch this idea. We had to do like a 30 second pitch and then um, the internet got to vote on which of the games they wanted to see made during the, the two week game jam. And uh, my game got picked. And so I got to lead a, a whole team. And one of the really interesting things, I guess, like we, I, I think we'll talk about it later, too. But one of the interesting things I learned is just like how much you have to be able to communicate with other disciplines when you're a designer about what it is, you know, like you have to be able to really clearly describe what it is you're after and what you're looking for. And so a lot of my work, I, I thought I would get to program a whole bunch, but I, in fact, I ended up spending a lot of time just making sure that my team actually knew exactly, like, you know, that they had all their questions answered. And there were parts of the, you know, parts of the design that I hadn't really thought through until someone actually came over and asked me, well, like, how is this actually supposed to work, you know? Um, so yeah, that's pretty much. That's been my experience. Oh, wait, you have the other way. <laughs> oh, it is on. Um, so I am a 3D and concept artist, uh, and that can mean a lot of different things, especially depending on where you are. I've worked in mobile and MMOs, and 3D or concept artist means totally different things in those spaces. Um, the studio that I'm at right now, Phenomena, we're doing sort of experimental games. Um, and what my job looks like on a day-to-day -day basis Usually, is we, we have an art director who he's more of an abstract artist. He came from a fine art background. And so my role tends to be an in-between with him and our engineer taking work and saying, where is the game? Um, yeah. OK. <laughs> All right. Um, hi, I'm Danielle Swank. Um, for me, I run an indie game studio, and it's a tiny studio. I think a lot of like larger studios, they tend to separate different disciplines and different designs, but at Barking Mouse, we have a holistic process in that everybody is responsible for everything. And so, <laughs> and so there's not really a way for us. We don't separate engineering from design. Um, our, both of the founders in our company come from a UX background, which means that what we focus on is the player's experience. And so for me, that's what design actually is and what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so we do an enormous amount of um, playtesting. Playtesting is how, for me, games evolve. Um, with my last game, when we were in active development for it, like if I was talking to you at the at the grocery store, you'd have your game in my hand. And I'd be like looking and seeing, oh, what do you do? You know. Um, because that for me is how people interact with the worlds that I create is my design process. You know, how are they frustrated at a certain point? Are they not understanding the next steps? You know, that for me is where, where games shine. Like where, if I can get somebody just in the middle of their busy, busy day-to-day -day life to spend five minutes with my creation, then I feel like I've done my job. Um, and on a day-to-day -day basis, what that is, is that's, that's engineering then. That, so that's taking you know, the stuff that I saw in my playtesting and saying, okay, well, I have to adjust this code and make the gameplay a little bit better. Oh wait, there, people are having trouble hitting their, their, uh, their touch targets, so uh, I have to make sure that that sampling area is bigger. You know, uh, game, I don't, yeah, I, I'm not actually sure how, to, how I would separate out those, those different disciplines. Um, it's a really holistic process at our studio. So um, I'm Mai, and I'm a game designer, so I don't draw and I don't code anything. <laughs> but um, my job is, like Danielle said, um, I care about the player experience. And what that means is, in mobile, you want the player to come back every single day. But also, you want to motivate them to spend and purchase things in your game. So for me, my day-to-day -day would look something like I would check in with my team. There's a lot of communication. I would find out what art assets I would need to create the content. And from there, I figure out, well, how does this work in the game world? What's the story here? Because we can't just put things in the game because it wouldn't make any sense. And then from there, we look at, well, if I put this item in, how does it work with the game economy? Because it's a live, ongoing game, and it's a service as well. And yeah, after that, um, since it's, it's in mobile, we get to check out the data. 
And from there I can see, okay, where are players stuck in the quests? Where, where is it too easy? Where is it too hard? And then for the next week's content, we would adjust it so we don't make the same mistakes. So yeah, I would say a game designer at Stormate is someone that is in constant communication with their teammates and, again, always thinking about the player's experience. So for those of you that have worked in multiple environments, I think the, the next thing we talked about, talking about was how is it different from one environment to another? And I think more specifically, how is the, your role different in a AAA versus kind of a smaller studio for those of you that have kind of both sides of that experience? Um, I spent about four years of my early career at EA, so which is a very triple A experience. And then I worked at Double Fine, which is about a 60 person studio when I was there. So I that's mid size, and now I'm at 10 person. So I've sort of seen my role um, through all these different scales. Um, I would say in triple A is definitely a lot more sort of, if you're an artist, then you're an artist. Like mo even more fine grained than what you even think. Like if you're an environment modeler, you probably wouldn't even get to make the textures. Like you're just modeling. And a lot of times your uh, art making is actually very um, separated from the design process. So which is why I prefer smaller studios because um, you just have to do more. And um, I feel like once it gets down to sort of maybe like a 20 person team, then just everyone has to do everything. And um, yeah, I guess that's sort of my view on how it's yeah. I, I think I should sort of say something similar. I think when I was working in MMOs, and it was sort of one of my first jobs, we were finding out that there was a, a girl in the environment department who, like, the only thing she did was paint rock textures. And, like, she was so good at it. She made amazing rocks. But, but that was, like, her whole job. She did that for, like, two years. Um, and like how specialized you could get in AAA. Um, and at smaller studios, it was, you, you get to have more hats. Um, the other thing that was uh, very different for me is how quickly your work ends up getting out there. Um, so if you're at a AAA studio, you might draw a concept and it doesn't get modeled for two months. It doesn't you know, get implemented. You don't see that in a game for like maybe years. Um, but in mobile, if you're working on a live game, then you get that concept that morning, it's modeled, and it's in the game tonight, which is, you know, it can be good or bad, depending. <laughs> but it's, it's much quicker. I had a very similar experience. So actually, I, I, when I started Double Fine, I didn't think of it as like a smaller studio. <laughs> well, I mean, I, yeah, that's true. It was mid -size. Well, so because we were, we were competing at the beginning, we were competing with AAA games. So that was kind of crazy. I mean, we had like, Jane was saying, we had about 60 people when we were doing this huge open world game. Um, but yeah, the difference is like, you got to work, you got to oversee a lot more of the design uh, or like the, a, lot, a lot more of like every, every step of the way. Actually, when we had our Amnesia Fortnite, uh, the very first game jam at the studio, we divided into very small teams. Uh, kind of, it was kind of like my first taste of what an indie studio would have been like. Um, I think our team was about seven people. We didn't get an audio person. And so I actually ended up doing a lot of the audio, like just you know picking out songs and whatever, just getting them in the game. And this is, this is kind of speaking to what you know, the, the other panelists were saying, that essentially you get to do a lot more and you're a lot more in touch with why things are where they are um, and you know, what the, I guess, the design uh, motivation for those things being in there. And that's, that's I, I would say personally, that's more gratifying. So we uh, we've kind of sit with or had a common theme here, which is you know what is it what's different between kind of indie development versus kind of more the AAA type of development. What I would be interested in is kind of to wrap up this topic is games as a service. Everybody's kind of talked about it a little bit, especially around like mobile. If you're building web games, if you've done open world MMOs. There's a big difference between a game that you ship on console that even if it has DLC and a game that you ship and then people play it every month and 
there's an expectation of content, whether that's on mobile or PC. Um, and so we have we do have some varied experience on that. People have worked on MMOs, people have worked on you know iOS titles and Android titles, or even smaller games that ship in a box, uh, which you know is not as popular these days. Uh, they still make a reasonable amount of money. Uh, so I'd be interested in kind of getting your perspective. What really, not just in the design, but what really changes fundamentally about the process and the game? Um, I don't have any AAA experience, just mobile. But as a game designer, I think it's still the same. Like, we still, we want to make fun games, right? At the end of the day, we want to make something fun, something enjoyable, and things that our players will love. Yeah, um, so for me, I, I only have an indie background, and we shipped a, a game. Like, it was over, it was done with, there was no extra content. Uh, I, though, come from a web background where that's so different, where web <laughs> websites are updated every day, twice a day, five times a day, you know, get crazy with it. Um, and so it was so nerve-wracking to me. Um, I know everybody says mobile's really fast, but, like, for me, that, like, day or two of, like, waiting for App Store approval was, like, wait, if there's a bug, I can't fix it, like, then? Um, so that's actually kept me up at night right before we shipped. Like, I made sure I QA'd everything, and then I QA'd some more. <laughs> um, I mean, it paid off in the end because we had zero crash reports, which is huge, but it was, it was a very, even mobile was a very, very different experience for me. Um, I've only worked on, like, non-surface light games. I guess the flip side of that is that if you're, um, especially the more sort of AAA you go, that people get really secretive about the development. And um, sometimes that really actually isn't good. So it's, it's very important to strike the balance of you wanting to do like your perfect creation and then, whoa, like this is the perfect thing. And then you show everybody. But like the thing is like what you think is good and what you're used to doing is not what new players would see. And I kind of sometimes wish Oh, I wish that our game is kind of more like a surface because then once we know, oh, a hundred people played it and they none of them got what we were trying to do, then you can maybe try to address it. But so for people who are doing non-surface light games without a lot of updates, then you have to really play test your game and <laughs> make sure what you're trying to communicate is indeed communicated before you let the baby go and then you can't touch it anymore. <laughs> Yeah, I have, I have just w one quick thing to add, like to the idea um, of work. Like when I think when I was coming up in school, and um, I I think I had a an idea of what game development was going to be like, and it wasn't going to be like a game takes longer to develop than it takes to go to high school or something. Like I mean, it's just I I thought you know I remember when we had our first like g studio game jam. I was like, this is what I thought in school. Like two weeks, you're done. You know, right? And it's like, I remember like there's uh, the Crossy Roads guys gave this talk at GDC and they were like, yeah, this game like took like six weeks or something. It was so long. We were like, yeah, I, <laughs> I think my shortest dev, dev cycle of a game I ever worked on it was, yeah, it was, it was a very long time. So um, that I think is another huge difference. Just when you're, if you're going to be working on a non-service game, it's possible that you're going to be on it, you can't even talk about it, and no one's going to see it for a very long time. Yeah, um, so the last mobile studio that I worked at was completely open development. We streamed our scrums, like, yeah, it was, it was insane, but it went over really, really well. Like, we had a following before our game was out, um, and we were getting feedback constantly from players, which, you know, like, some people are down for that and some people aren't. <laughs> um, but I think open development is an interesting space that people are getting into. Uh, also, something that was very uh, strange as an artist when I was working on games as a service is you're getting immediate data feedback on your art. You can say, like, the blue armor did way better than the red armor, uh, and, and you have numbers. So that, that was very strange. Strange in, like, a way that was good or strange? I, I mean, it, yeah, I, th I think it was good. Um, I think it, it's just, like, as an artist, I think you're usually sort of, like, working in a bubble and hoping that people like your work and, and having literal numbers, like a sheet of data about what did well and what did not was interesting. So I think the the next thing that we had we were talking about was do you kind of uh, 
do you get a pass as an indie dev, right? Because you're a five-person studio, you know, is your quality bar lower? Can you actually put something out there that's better? Or sorry, that's not as good as a AAA studio would? Yeah, I think I, I'd like to take this one first. Um, you don't. Like, <laughs> that's the sad truth about indie development. You are, your games are judged on the same scale as everybody else's games. So they have to, like, no matter what, um, you know, my games are judged at a AAA level, which, you know, is, is fine, actually, because I feel like as a single person, I should be able to do AAA quality. What I can't do, because I don't have another 100 people working with me, is I can't do AAA scope. But, what I, but I can take my little tiny game and I can polish it up and make it this little jewel box of a game. Um, actually, the first game um, that we made, the idea from it came from Skyrim. <laughs> we, we lo I love Skyrim, but what, and my, one of my favorite parts is there's a lock picking mini game in, inside of it. And it's just, it's amazing how much tension, how much emotion that these people were able to put in just this little simple rotational mechanic. And I'm like, wow, that's amazing. I can't do Skyrim, but I can do the lock picking game. <laughs> um, um, do we get a pass? I would say, I would say I want there to be an indie pass. Um, I guess the only sort of pass you get is that, um, as a smaller indie, you are free to do the more open development and you are free to engage with your community and like possible fans more. Um, so you do get to sort of tell them how you came up with your um, ideas. This is how we've been doing it. Look at how hard it's been. And people, I think, do sort of resonate with the story of you developing something uh, more so than if you're a AAA. So like, that would be the only pass I think you would get because otherwise, if your game doesn't work, it doesn't work. It doesn't matter if people paid sixty dollars for it or twenty dollars for it; they will still, you know, hate you and yell at you on Twitter <laughs> and all those things. Um, but um, the only, yeah, the only thing is that you do get to have more of a personal connection with your fans and your community, and it, it can be very rewarding. And I, and if anyone here is doing indie stuff, I strongly strongly encourage you to do more open development because it actually you get a lot out of it, I think. This is, I just, while, while um, we were discussing this, I just had like a bit of a devil's advocate idea about this. So it, you don't get a pass if you're trying to be in a commercial space. If you're trying, if you're really, if you're in it, if you really want to make a great game and uh, be able to sell it, you don't get a pass because you're going to be competing against much bigger budget. You know, let's be realistic here. However, if, you're, if your focus is to do something experimental and crazy and, you know, really put all of, like, you know, maybe may even make a statement, like, you know, this isn't about visual appeal. I mean, you can still do polish in ways that are different from, you know, the traditional ideas of polish, right? So you can still, and I think that's totally acceptable. And, like, I think th there's, you can do a lot of really innovative and weird things. Like, there, you know, Tale of Tales recently announced, unfortunately, that they're not going to make games. But all of their games, um, while they, you know, they were somewhat polished experiences, all did something interesting, and there is real value in that. All right. Do we have any questions in the audience? Okay. Oh, excellent. Uh, I'm so glad that there are some artists on the panel for this particular question. So back in the day when arcade games were very popular, there wasn't a lot of graphic fidelity that was available, and a lot of the game mechanics really stood on their own. In this day and age, we have so much more opportunity in that sense. Do you think that from a design perspective that visuals get in the way sometimes of great mechanics? Um, I, I don't think they should. I think. Um it's easier to wow people there now, um, but I don't think that great games are doing that. Uh, or well, I don't think that they're not wowing people, but I don't think that the great games that you see aren't uh, still solid in their mechanics. Do you wanna, do you wanna go? I, cause I, um. I guess, like, for me, I'm kind of a picky player. Like, if a game isn't beautiful in some way, I actually really, it's very hard for me to personally enjoy it. Um, but I think the difference is that now, 
there are a lot of ways to make beautiful games. It's not just that, well, I have, you know, just many normal maps or whatever. Like, that is not what makes a beautiful game, right? You can have um, very stylized stuff and whatnot, and, like, all that can, uh, as long as all that kind of art, but not all the graphics, you know, all the actual attention to beautiful art is in surface of what you're trying to do with your game. Like, if it's like a, let's say, like, we're doing narrative games, so a lot of times I tell myself, it's like, well, I really want to make some more rocks because I love it and it's beautiful. It's like, well, does the fourth rock make your story better? Then if not, then stop making more rocks. Like, make something that, <laughs> that can actually service your story. So like, I think as long as the art is there to not just be sparkly, then I think it could make your experience a lot better. Just because, you know, it, I mean, games are like a visual audio, all that kind of stuff, right? It could add a lot, and it could make it just very distracting, too. So, so for, for me, personally, working with artists, um, fidelity is the thing that, is, that makes, makes it difficult. Like, the higher fidelity your game is, the more difficult it is if you decide to, you know, do something, you completely, like, change... Um, mechanics or aspects of the you, know, you if you for instance adding a character is a huge cost for instance for your animators for your modelers things like that so if your character if your game is beautiful but lower fidelity you might be able to do that at a much cheaper cost and without you know agonizing over it as much so i think it it really depends i think um on if we're talking like a realistic game then it's going to be really difficult to do a high you know the, I guess the art may get in the way of doing some crazy stuff because you know real with realism you have constraints that you wouldn't if you if you had a more stylized look or something like that. Um also I think fidelity like high fidelity stuff is not necessarily where a lot of interesting things are happening right now. Um if you look at mobile like Monument Valley uh Princess Ida maybe had 50 polygons um two colors and I still think that was one of the best game character designs that I've seen in a while. Um, so in a lot of mobile games, you're looking at like PS1 level graphics, 8-bit graphics are coming back. Um, there's still cool stuff happening with very little resources. I just want to give you a word of encouragement about uh, uh, Indy getting a pass, and that is that um, you must be aware, and if you're not, you will be in a second, that uh, the Steam machine is going to largely be the platform for Indy. And, and that's because it's a unique OS, uh, it's an open OS, and so they're not gonna spend a lot of time and money porting over old console and PC games. They're gonna start new with, with Indies, so you have a platform all to yourself. What I heard uh, through the talk that really resonated with me, I've been a designer since like 95 and worked on AAA from Tony Hawk's Pro Skater. I am now um, creative director at a indie studio in Emeryville. And the thing that's correlated the most to the quality of the game is what you're talking about in terms of getting everyone on the team to understand that they too are designers. When a gameplay programmer decides that we're going to use a radius-based system for detection, that carries so much weight with it. So I would love to hear if any of you have had um, either one very successful or very unsuccessful thing that you tried to convey that message of ownership of the design to your teams. So ownership for us is built into our DNA. Um, we we all, since we all do everything, um, but it's really interesting. Um, like my partner also does play testing as well, and when he noticed that people were missing hit targets on um, on smaller screens, he in introduced um, stochastic touch sampling. Um, so yeah, we did have then a bigger radius and of, um, and that improved our mobile experience enormously. Um, but, it, but it's stuff like that. Um, I work also with contractors, and we try to, um, while we control the creative direction, we also try to empower them to do their jobs um, to the fullest abilities. Um, so, like, if I'm using a contractor that I work with, um, you know, uh, before and on a regular basis that we've developed a bunch of trust with, you know, I'm like, oh, okay, here's, these are the textures that we're gonna put on the models. Um, these are some vague ideas I have about this. What do you think? And, you know, go run with it. Um, because I do think it is important that everybody should have um, ownership and understand kind of the principles behind the game that you're trying to make. Otherwise, you know, you, you, get, you get a less cohesive uh, theme. You know, because people will still go and do their 
do their work to the best of their abilities, but if they don't understand kind of the reason and the ownership behind what they're doing, then you get a bunch of different perspectives instead of a cohesive perspective. Um, this may be a controversial thing to say, but um, I also feel like if you're small a team and you get a group of people together with a very specific knowledge that if you guys don't make it together, there's no second game. That really, really pushes the whole ownership thing <laughs> like you wouldn't believe. Like, I feel like I, I mean, I'm pretty close to a lot of sort of tech world people and I've seen, like I always, I used to think that, oh, if you just have a smaller team, then everyone buys in and blah, blah, blah. But actually I've stopped thinking that. Like I feel like a lot of it is just like if you have, like if, somehow you have a small team but there's so like you you've thrown so much money or resource that somehow like you know that fire under your butt is just not the same as if you're like hey like this is our baby and you know if we want to try to you know make a second game or whatever like this is your one chance and you know let's all really you know and and that understanding has to be from day one and i feel like that really like i feel like that's the only sure way that i personally know of that really ensures ownership so for my game, it's a live game, and our team is very small. So actually, one of our producers went up to me and was like, Misha, what do you think of like a monster raid in your game? And I was like, a monster raid? What do you mean? He's like, you know, like, go beat up monsters and stuff. And I was like, yeah, OK. Like, I took his idea, and I, you know, we would work it around to make it fit in with the game world, but it wasn't like, no, you're not designing my game. I would listen to like, other people's ideas and like, yeah, I think this could work. So I, I, my experience is actually primarily in web, and then the studio I'm doing right now is mobile, and I came from a traditional app background. Um, but something that I took from kind of app development, even enterprise development, that has worked really well with my teams is everything we talk about is in terms of the player experience. So my background is very heavy in like network programming. So when I get a, a network person and the person's like, oh, it doesn't really matter what I do. How does that impact the player experience? It's like, um, duh, it impacts every time it talks to the server, you know, everything about the game, if you're building kind of a service or a, a client server based game can be impacted or made better if it's faster, if you're geographically distributed. So the, the, it really what has worked well for me with my teams in the past has been take the thing they're working on and tie it to something that is visual in the game, even if it's something that you would normally only see on the command line or if you rendered it in Maya. Like talk to them, walk them through the process. And what that really equates to when you're running the studio and I think, or when you're a designer, is you need to know enough about every discipline to understand how they really do impact the game, right? How it builds cohesion and how, you know, having a, you know, putting your finger on the screen and having the, the sheep explode as an actual, you know, kind of like little thing that somebody adds into the game, that fits, but it might not have fit if they had done it a different way. So I think that's really what it comes down to, or that's what I've had the most success with. Uh, Brian Davis, um, very, very small studio here, me and my son, um, Josiah Davis. Right. <laughs> um, we built a game called Paper Chase, um, and we were surprised to get about two million uh, downloads in, in this short amount of time. Congratulations. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Um, and then we got some investor money, and so I'm going to ask you a hypothetical. Uh, if you had that kind of success, and we only had one level in our game, um, but people really loved it, obviously, would you take the investor money and say that you know it's around like half a million dollars? Um, would you take that investor money and build more content and focus it on building a bigger game, or would you focus it on building uh, game economy? Um, or would you split it like 50-50, or would you split it 20-80, or that kind of thing? I know it's like kind of re really vague, hypothetical, but just in the interest of time. So for me, it, it would really, you're very small. It would really depend on kind of what my goal was, right? Is it a goal of a lifestyle business that supports you um, and kind of keeps you running month to month and maybe gives you a little bit of disposable income and a small amount of growth? Or do you want to build, you know, the next... $100 million title. I mean, I think everybody wants to build the next $100 million title. Like, I, if you don't, then you're 
a little bit different than other people. Um, but you really have to think about what are you trying to get from that. Um, and it would there would be a lot of factors, I think, that would go into how I would spend that money or what I would do. Who am I getting the money from? What can they buy me? Is it strategic money? Can they help me publish? Can they help me market my game as well? Um, and then things like you have something that people love. I would say I'm partial to build more of the thing that people that the things that people love. But if you feel like at the core you can't actually make money from the game, there isn't a good monetization loop or a mechanic, or you feel like it's too bolted on, that might force me to kind of look at doing something differently. So it, it really is dependent on the situation. But I'd first start with what's your goal, right? In terms of what do you feel like you can get from this, and then what does it buy you? Come from a future perspective, and that would be whether or not I was I was going to be willing to take the cash or not and move forward with it. Um, I was like, do you also the thing is like, if you really want to make more content for it because you enjoy it, that's one thing. Or like, are people asking for more content? Are they paying, willing to pay money for it? I don't think all those things you need to consider. But it's also fine to just have a short and sweet thing and then have another idea. You know, if that's what you want to do. Feel like 